Good afternoon, dear viewers. Speaking with you today is Nawad Al Amri, a banking and finance lawyer at ATC of Baghdad. And uh, to the right side of me, my esteemed colleague, Ali Adabba. Ali, if you can please introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Ali Adabba. I'm a senior associate in our bank, in, in our corporate commercial department, although I do a very much a lot of banking with Nawar. I am a New York attorney and an Iraqi lawyer educated in Iraq, also hopefully by next year a UK solicitor. Um, take us through the topic today. So today we're going to discuss letters of guarantee, letters of credit, and if the time allows us, we might go into the Iraqi monetary policy and the INCO terms for 2010. Ali, can you define what letters of guarantees are? Yes. So letters of guarantee, as the name implies, are guarantees given by a bank. They are part of the tools used in trade finance. Um, unlike their sister, letters of credit, letters of guarantee are meant to be used when things go wrong, typically. So an applicant goes to a bank and issues a letter of guarantee in favor of a, of a beneficiary. The bank is required to pay a certain amount to the beneficiary on request. Okay. And the bank cannot object on the basis of the relationship between the applicant and the beneficiary. So typically, for example, in government contracts, letters of guarantee are used as performance bonds. When a contractor gets is awarded a contract from the government, the government requires them to issue a letter of guarantee as a performance bond, and they only release it after the contractor performs their contract and issues the final uh, performance certificate. Another example of using letters of guarantee is to secure the advance payment paid to a contractor. This is very common in construction contracts as well. So the employer would pay the contractor money and the contractor is supposed to use that money to perform the contract. In exchange, the contractor provides the employer with a letter of guarantee. Should the contractor fail to perform the contract, the letter of guarantee provides the employer with security in the form of the ability to demand payment from a bank to return the advance payment. And often there are rules to either reduce the letter of guarantee provided for the advance payment as the contract progresses or um, otherwise deal with the matter. Now, the other topic we're going to talk about which is very similar are letters of credit. Letters of credit are meant to be as a form of payment. So a letter of credit, um, for example, in a sales contract, there are three, the three same parties. There is an applicant, there is a beneficiary, and there is a bank. The letter of credit operates in making sure that the beneficiary receives the payment on presentation of certain documents to a bank. So suppose we are in a sale contract. You're shipping things to me from China, and we don't really trust each other. We're just getting to know each other in that case. And we want to uh, have a pre-agreed method through banks to make sure that when you are delivered the goods, I will get my money. Okay? So we would agree beforehand that I put the goods with the shipper, I receive bills of lading, other documents that prove ownership of the goods, and then I would send those to the bank, okay? Your bank, pre the one that issued the letter of credit on your application. The bank would get the documents and release payment to me, and then the bank would transfer the documents to you. You would use the documents to get the goods. So it's a method of payment. If things go right, the letter of credit would be used, unlike, unlike the letter of guarantee. Great. Can we expand on the types of letters of guarantee and letters of credit? So in principle, there are confirmed and unconfirmed letters of credit. You could say that there may be some unconfirmed letters of guarantee, but that's really unlikely. A letter of, whenever you're dealing with multiple banks across borders, there is the issuing bank. So for example, back to our previous example, one of, we were in different countries. So a bank, you know, your bank may be a Chinese bank, okay? And I am an Iraqi customer of yours. I do not want to go to China to collect my money. 
What I would do, what, what we would agree, is that you, we would deal through a second bank called the Correspondent Bank, which would be in Iraq. There are, broadly speaking, two types of either letters of credit or bank guarantees. They could be confirmed or non-confirmed. This, uh, this distinction becomes apparent when you're dealing cross-border because back to the sale example, for example, the seller would have their bank in one country and the buyer is in a different country. The buyer wants the security of, you know, the party being paid wants the security of a local bank that they can collect from. And therefore, there is an issuing bank and there is a confirming bank, or a, more precisely, a corresponding bank. The corresponding bank could be a confirming bank or it could be not a confirming bank. The difference is, in one situation where the letter of credit is confirmed, you can sue the local bank. If it is not confirmed, the local bank will only act as a mailman. They would forward the documents and then, when they receive the payment, they would deposit it in the beneficiary's account. So it basically, if the letter of credit is not confirmed, then you have to sue in the in the other jurisdiction. Thank you. What about the letters of guarantees? When can we use a letter of guarantee? So a letter of guarantee, for example, is mostly used, as we explained, in uh, performance bonds, advance payments, security for advance payments. They could be used as security for the contract in general, should the parties uh, have a liquidated damages clause and the party who has a claim under the liquidated damages clause wants the certainty that it will be paid from a bank, it would be able to issue, you know, it would require a letter of guarantee to secure that obligation. This is because the letters of guarantee are payable on demand. They cannot be conditional. Even if the parties agree to some condition in a letter of guarantee, Iraqi law does not allow it, but uh, the banking rules that generally apply to the letters of guarantee, such as the, the Uniform Divan Guarantee Rules, allow some conditions. However, they must be documentary conditions. So a letter of guarantee may specify that the, a certain form has to, be, has to be used in the demand. And as long as that form is used to demand payment, the bank has to pay. Of course, as long as it's used within the validity period of a letter of guarantee. Once the validity period of a letter of guarantee expires, the bank no longer has an obligation. So what typically happens in that situation is that the beneficiary, if the contract has not been performed in total, the beneficiary would ask the applicant to either extend the validity, the validity period of the letter of guarantee or they would liquidate it otherwise. They have the right to do that, at, you know, because they cannot. Uh, liquidation of a letter of a letter of guarantee will always result in payment, even if it's a breach of contract. In which case, the beneficiary would have to sue separately for a breach of contract. What ends up happening because of this under Iraqi government contracts, they always drag on more than expected, and the government always tends to. Um, in fact, not tends to. The government always requires extension of letters of guarantee, and this can take on for much, much longer than initially anticipated, and the parties could end up liable for fees to the bank to extend these letters of guarantee. So we always recommend contractors to take into account these matters such as these when they're entering into government contracts. Great. Uh, can we talk about letters of credit and letters of guarantee from a regulatory point of view? What does regulate letters of credit and letters of guarantee? So the applicable rules under Iraqi law are, find, are found in the Code of Commerce. The Code of Commerce provides a little bit of rules. It's not very expansive or comprehensive, but the basic principles are that a letter of guarantee cannot be conditional. A, le a bank cannot object to, to the demand for payment on the basis of the relationship between a principal and the beneficiary. And uh, the more specific rules are found in rules that have been established by the banks themselves. They're, can they, they're not law per se, but they're very much frequently used. They're standardized rules issued by the ICC, the Uniform Rules for Demand Guarantees, and the Uniform Credit uh, uh, customer, customers, Customs and Practices, the UCCP. Um, those documents, they're updated every now and then. They provide standardized rules. If uh, the, a case lands in, in, in court and the bank has specified that these contract, that these standard rules apply, they become part of the contract that is either the letter of credit or the demand guarantee. 
If no such specification specification has been made in the contract, the default rules of the Code of Commerce would apply. Thank you. What's uh, about the UCCP rules, the URDG 758, for example, uh, since it's a standardized rules, why is it best to apply these general rules and guidelines? So the banks created those rules. The reason why they did that is to streamline their operations, obviously. It makes it so that they do not have to negotiate every new letter of guarantee that they issue. There is standardized forms, standardized practices. Can we talk about why is it best practice to apply these general standards such as the UCCP and UFDG? So, the banks have created these rules, obviously, and uh, the main benefit of using these rules from the bank's perspective is that they provide consistency. Um, they make the bank, they streamline the bank's business. They make it more, uh, you know, they have set forms, they do not have to negotiate every new letter of credit. Um, it makes it cheaper for the uh, consumers, for the people you know, issuing these things to get them, because the bank has to spend less resources. And, it, and most importantly, these rules provide certainty. So the Iraqi law, in particular the Code of Commerce, doesn't have detailed rules that govern letters of guarantee and, and uh, letters of credit. Um, the rules used by the banks uh, provide a lot of context and that is very valuable when using these trade finance rules. Keep in mind that the whole purpose of the parties using these tools is to have certainty of payment when certain uh, conditions are met with the banks. Um, if you do not, if you have a letter of guarantee that is just governed by the general principles, you may end up in situations where there could be more arguments and more uncertainty. Can we go into talking about, in practice, whether it's uh, from a governmental entity's point of view or judiciary point of view. In practice, what usually are the biggest obstacles in regards to letters of guarantee and letters of credit, if there are any? So, in practice, a lot of the contracts in Iraq are government contracts. There is a healthy, you know, private practice, but there is a lot of the contracting going on is done by the government. The, go the government is often the issuer of letters of credit and the beneficiary of demand guarantees. So in that context, um, there, there isn't much special about it. However, the banks, when they are issuing demand guarantees, uh, a demand guarantee should ensure payment on demand, as the name implies. The banks uh, often in Iraq refuse payment and require a court order. It is just a procedure, it has become a procedural practice when a bank refuses to, when they often do pay up on the demand guarantee, the, the beneficiary would then sue the bank and just go through the motions of the formalities to get a court order and then they would, uh, the bank would pay. So it's just a matter of either delaying or making it a bit difficult. Um, some banks uh, do try to resist payment even more, but uh, the courts have been cleared. They are, they properly apply the law, and where there's a demand guarantee and a qualif and a proper demand within time, they would order payment. Um, letters of credit, um, the, the 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 dispute and the practice that tends to arise on letters of credit, often relates to the types of documents required. So government contracts often require. Uh, certain certificates to release the letter to re release the payments under the letters of credit, and sometimes the government when they would when they uh, th there is a, the last payment in a contract, they would uh, make that payment conditional on receiving the final approval certificate, and that takes time. So you end up with a contract that has a payment that is stuck and not released simply because you you have delivered the goods. They have been received, they have been accepted. Well, you have this one last certificate that they have included in the terms of payment for the letters of credit and you cannot release the payment and that, until that document issued. So best practice when you are negotiating a contract and then when you are checking the paperwork for that contract, the letter of credit, because it, that would be the payment mechanism, is to make sure that whatever documents are listed on the letter of credit issued by the bank match the payment conditions under the contract. Because if there are additional conditions, those will delay or make it more difficult to get paid. 
can we talk about the recent developments in the Iraqi monetary policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, limiting the dealings and provision of all services and goods in Iraq to Iraqi dinar and in accordance with the fixed rate that is determined by the CBI even though because it, this can be confusing since Iraq follows an uh, open market policy when it comes to monetary policy can we talk about it briefly then go into how it relates to the liquidation of letters of guarantee yes so um, as per the central bank law there is a clause about freedom of currency so there is no statutory restrictions on dealing with in foreign currency however recently the council of ministers has issued decisions restricting dealings within in iraq to iraqi dinars um, this does not this is not meant to affect uh, cross-border trade so you know basically importing however the banks often have problems when it comes to sourcing liquidity in foreign currency because up until very recently the central bank required the banks to only purchase dollars through its auction it has now allowed the banks to deal more with correspondent banks hopefully by next year they would have more liquidity when it comes to for example uh, financing a, an import contract okay in terms of locally in iraq currently uh, the courts have been enforcing so when you when you when you demand payment in dollars from a bank and the bank responds by we will pay you in iraqi dinars this situation has not been clarified yet so cases are still developing some courts have ruled that uh, the payment from a bank not, not specifically from a bank but the payment of a judgment ordered in dollars for example should be at the market exchange rate at the time of payment because while the government you know is is stating that it it the, the central bank would sell dollars uh, at the official exchange rate the market has different rates because it's difficult to access the central bank auction one final question uh, are there any other developments when it comes to the iraqi monetary policy so the central bank has been trying to um, stabilize the exchange rates in iraq the dollar to dinar exchange rates which has been affected by increased scrutiny from the federal reserve um, iraq is now experiencing something akin to capital controls um, de facto that's not the official position but the reality is it is difficult to move dollars in and out of iraq and dollar transactions in iraq are becoming very very difficult um, this is being caused by uh, the limited uh, cash available to banks the fact that until recently the central bank has been uh, requiring all banks to transact through it through the central bank and not use correspondent banks this has changed recently uh, recently uh, about 14 banks were sanctioned by the federal reserve from you know they're no longer able to deal in dollars and that has sent a lot of shockwaves to the iraqi economy this has effectively resulted in increased restrictions on transactions whether domestic or international. Uh, just one point of clarification, were they sanctioned or barred? Because the official position of the US Treasury that these 14 banks were barred from dealing in dollars internationally. But the official position of the Central Bank of Iraq that these 14 banks are sanctioned. So are they sanctioned or barred? It appears to be that, uh, technically speaking, they could, you know, these sanctions are not permanent. So you could say that uh, once these banks get their things in order and comply with some inspections and regulations, you know, they could be lifted. In that sense, you would say um, it could have been barred. And my understanding is, you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the, according to the terms used by the US Treasury, a, a barred is more of a temporary thing and sanctions are more permanent if under that logic it would be more of being barred than completely sanctioned exactly and not only that if i may expand a little bit uh, these 14 banks some of them have issued public statements saying that they are fully ready uh, to be audited and comply with any requirements the u.s treasury has in order to lift these bans 
Thank you, Ali, for this lovely introduction to letters of guarantees, letters of credit, and uh, uh, the Iraqi monetary policy and the recent developments in the Iraqi monetary policy. Most welcome. Um, I hope this was uh, an interesting discussion for our viewers. Uh, we're always here to help when it comes to either dealing with government contractors or dealing with contracts in general, um, or the, you know understanding the practices available in Iraq and the, implica the implications of the various policies that are being enacted.